I'm sorry for the delay. Okay, good morning, everyone. I'm Kristen McKenzie, president of the Fine Arts Society of Peoria, and I want to welcome you to the February Fine Arts Society lecture. We're halfway through our season, exploring ways that artists have responded to their environment. We started by um, looking at traditional Dene weaving traditions and a number of contemporary Native American artists who find inspiration in the landscape. Our second lecture explored the fascination of 19th century American artists with the landscape of the Hudson River Valley, especially through the, uh, as depicted by female artists. In December, we learned how the technology of photography has shaped our concept of pre preserving natural landscape as national and other park sites over the past 150 years. Today, our topic is how African-American artists Excuse me. Um, in the course of today's lecture, we will learn about land art and meet artists concerned with environmental issues throughout the world. We will be challenged to expand our definition of art and see works that engage with time for their existence, whether inside a gallery or museum setting or responding to the elements of the landscape. It is my pleasure to welcome today's speaker, Juarez Hawkins. She was actually our last in-person speaker in Peoria about a week before COVID shut everything down last year and certainly has been one of our most enthusiastic and dynamic speakers. Ms. Hawkins is a native of Chicago, a second generation artist working in painting, ceramics and printmaking, a museum exhibition curator, and for the past 20 years, a popular lecturer 15 of those at Chicago State University. She received her BA from Northwestern University and her MA in Interdisciplinary Arts from Columbia College in Chicago. She has exhibited throughout Chicago, including the Nathan and Nathan Gallery, Woman Made Gallery, and the Chicago Cultural Center. Ms. Hawkins is a member of Sapphire and Crystals, a collective of women artists of African descent in Chicago. Juarez, welcome and please share your screen with us right. today. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for having me. So let's see if we can do the tech thing and get that to work. All right, I think I did it. Let's see what happens when I go full screen. Perfect, okay. So can everyone hear me okay? Um, I guess um, I won't know, but if I sound like I'm me, do let me know. We can hear you. Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, in talking about African American artists in the environment, I'm going to deal with some sort of a variety of different areas, certainly issues of ecology and sustainability come into play, but also issues of race, class, agency, access, and those things will come into play as well. So we're going to tackle this issue from a couple of different fronts. But first, our musical interlude before we even begin. Oh, oh, mercy, mercy me. You can sing in if you, you know the song. All oh, things ain't what they used to be. No, no. Where did all the blue skies go? Poison is the wind that blows from the north and south and east. Oh, mercy, mercy me. All oh, things ain't what they used to be. Oh, oil wasted on the oceans and upon our seas, fish full of mercury. So this song is by Marvin Gaye. It's part of an album called What's Going On that was released back in 1971. And a lot of people heard this album and maybe some of you heard that song and you just danced to it and just thought it was a really nice stepper cut. But what you see from the lyrics here is that as far back as 1970, you have an artist here that was addressing in his work issues central to the ecology. In fact, this song is subtitled The Ecology. And so further verses, he goes on to talk about radiation underground in the sky, how the birds and the fish are dying off. And he ends with this question, how much more 
can this land stand of man's abuse? And so it's really, again, very fun, very pop culture. But when you take a moment and stop popping your fingers, you see there's some very serious issues underfoot. And again, as far back as the 70s, when the idea of ecology was really coming into popular consciousness, certainly isn't the first time that people were dealing with these issues, but they started to become very popular in the 1970s. So my first area I'm gonna talk about, we're gonna step back a little bit and look at a little bit of history. And so these are artists who are coming to us purely because of their love of the land, the love of nature, and that need to preserve it and see it and show it. Our first artist is coming to us from the 19th century. This is Grafton Tyler Brown. Um, you notice the dates. I'm usually not a heavy date person with my students because sometimes I don't remember them. But it's interesting to note the dates here where I've included them because it gives us an insight into how these artists intersect with history. So if we're looking at this particular piece done in 1887, you know, we're only talking maybe 20 years out from slavery. So during the time when many African Americans were grappling with issues of reconstruction, black codes, and that sort of thing, you have many artists who were making their way west. They were part of that westward expansion. There were ho black homesteaders and black cowboys and black gold miners. Grafton Tyler Brown, who incidentally was freeborn, he makes his way to San Francisco as a young adult and begins to ply his trade as a lithographer. And so that's a really pretty handy way to make a living. Um, again, we're looking at the rise of mining in California. So he's able to uh, produce scrip and posters and even maps and cartography really became like one of his things then, but as a way of supporting himself. And he even was hired at different points by the government to actually create these documents of these different mountain ranges and different um, landscapes. So he went from just doing them for pay to doing them for just the sheer joy of doing them. And this is just one of a vast array of landscapes that this gentleman made for us. The next artist uh, we're going to see, and we're going to see him a little bit at the end too, so I have a surprise for you at the end. This is Robert S. Duncanson. He's also born freeborn in New York around 1821. And it's important to note that again, 1821 and even in 1841 when Grafton Tyler Brown was born, most Africans, a good number of African Americans were enslaved at that time. So to have freeborn artists who again, not only had the freedom to maybe get some training and education, but oftentimes they may have, you know, a little bit better means than the average person coming out of an agrarian background. So it's really fortunate that we have these records. Robert Duncanson is actually self-taught. He applied his trade as a house painter. And at that time, if you had a decent amount of money, not only could you get your walls painted a beautiful shade of ecru, but you can actually have someone maybe paint portraits or landscapes directly onto your wall. And so this is a skill that Robert Duncanson picked up. And there actually still are houses that have some of his murals actually like painted right onto the wall. Like um, Grafton Tyler Brown, he did a vast number of landscapes. And what you can see here is this is an artist who's paying a lot of attention to the Hudson River School. You guys have probably already seen that the previous presentation and know some of the characteristics of that school of um, that school of painting. Most notably, huge skies, really, you know, sky and background and mountains tend to take up most of the scene. Usually, if there are people involved in that scene at all, they're really very, very tiny, you know. And again, that idea was to show the majesty of the land, show, you know, some might even argue the majesty of God and how really tiny and relatively insignificant we human beings are in comparison to all of this vast landscape. 113. There are some who even some scholars who even argue that this particular piece, the little Miami River piece, may have had some significance on the Underground Railroad as a site for escaped slaves. Needless to say, that probably wasn't well publicized. Moving on. 
What you're looking at here are a series of landscapes. We're moving into the 20th century. And what we're looking at is work that's coming out of about, say, 1950s Florida. So now we're well past slavery, but we're still dealing with a significant amount of Jim Crow, a significant amount of segregation. And remember, even though Florida is a destination in 1950, it very much was the South and all that went with it. So out of that comes a body of artists, anywhere from 10 to 26, depending on the history that you're looking at, who decided that they wanted to paint the landscape and capture the beauty of where they live, but also they needed to find a way to actually promote their work and to sell it. And so they came up with this idea to start selling their work along highways, along roadsides, and just selling work to tourists or people who were driving by. And amazingly enough, they were really quite successful at it. In the later years, this group of artists would be dubbed the highway men. Uh, that wasn't a term they thought of back then in the 50s. They were just artists trying to survive. But later on, that idea of where they sold their work became part of their moniker. And so you can see really just a lot of really beautiful work. I mean, it may seem a little touristy to us now because you know we're all postmodern and all that sort of thing, but this work was actually very popular. And considering that for many of these people, the only alternative might have been working in a field, manual labor, scrubbing someone's floors and toilets and stuff, they were actually, many of them were able to scratch out a fairly decent living hustling their paintings by the side of the road. So here, what we've got here, Alfred Hare, Harold Newman are sort of the ringleaders of that movement, certainly among the more prolific and more longer sustaining artists of that period. But I'd be remiss if I did not include the, the one woman of the highwaymen, sort of the queen mother of the highwaymen, Miss Mary Ann Carroll, um, who had the fortune. She lived until about um, maybe 2017, 2019 or so. And in 2011, she had the honor of being able to give uh, Michelle Obama one of her paintings. She had been invited to a first lady's luncheon and then she gifted the former first lady with one of her pieces. So really kind of a great honor after the fact, but you can really see why, really just very fresh takes on the Florida landscape. And now for something completely different, I present to you Alma Thomas. Um, she's born in 1891 in Georgia. She's lived most of her life in the greater Washington DC area where she worked as a school teacher. She's a Howard grad and just fun facts here. Um, one of the first graduates in fine art from Howard. She does go on to become the first African-American woman to have a, show, a solo show at the Whitney Museum and also the first African-American female artist to have work hanging in the White House. Again, and as part of the permanent collection. So here, um, she didn't really start really working her, her craft full time until she had retired. She was well in her 60s when she really, you know, got eager and got really busy with her painting. And so by this point, you're starting to see these trends in modernism, abstract work, dare we say minimalism even. And so these things are, seem, are filtering into her work. I like this piece here because there's a lot of layers here. Her take on the landscape is not necessarily literal. One might argue it's more of an impression or more of a feeling, but this sort of broken brushstroke that you see throughout her work really becomes a hallmark of her style. Next, we have Richard Mayhew, again, another 20th century artist. And Richard Mayhew is of African-American and native descent. A good chunk of the work that he does is honoring the landscape of Northern California where he lives. And so you have these really lush, very vibrant, almost electric kind of landscapes, kind of a different way of handling it. Excuse me. A number of these, he's not necessarily even working from a literal reference. He's really working off the visions in his head, which is just even all the more stunning. And really work deserves to be, to be given a look in person. If you have a chance to see a Richard Mayhew show, I definitely would encourage you to go see it. I think he's been uh, represented by G.R. Nanamdi um, in Detroit. 
Here in Chicago, a little closer to home, this piece is part of a little strip of land that runs along Lakeshore Drive. It's known as the Burnham Wildlife Corridor. And in this little spot, this little green spot along this highway, several artists were charged with creating meeting spaces or gathering spaces. So there were several of them really probably from the middle of the city moving all the way to the south side where you find this piece. This was a team of artists and muralists and woodworkers and painters, and they created this piece called Sankofa for the Earth. So what you're seeing is the central piece. There are seating and logs and things that are all the way around, again, with that idea of making it a meeting space. And so what they're going for here, Sankofa is an Adinkra term, West African term, which means go back and get it. And what the, the meaning of the term is, it's saying that you need to go back and retrieve your history. You need to be clear about where you've come from before you can move forward. So the Sankofa is always represented as a bird with his head turned to the back as it faces forward to move. And also you notice here the inset that's over to the right, the bird is holding a seed of potential in its beak. So it's really a lovely mixed media. You've got the painting, you've got all this really rich mosaic. And then on the back of the sculpture, you have this history. So while you're sitting and chilling, enjoying the lakefront, enjoying the art, you also have an opportunity to really learn the history of Black Chicago from Jack Johnson, the Gwendolyn Brooks, Emmett Till, Margaret Burroughs, all the way through to the Southside Community Art Center, which is another story in and of itself, I, I'll say for another time. But the piece is still standing. So if you get a chance to come to Chicago, it's right off 47th and Lakeshore Drive. This piece is also in the Chicago area. This piece is hosted at the Nathan Manilow Sculpture Park, which is at Governor State University. There is really large, they've dedicated several acres to large scale public art and land art. This piece is by Martin Perrier. And those of you who are familiar with Perrier, you might know already that the bulk of his art, whether it's studio art, public art, or you know, just small pieces, he's generally working with natural objects. His background is more of a carpentry background. When he was younger, he used to make like guitars and do wood, woodworking, that sort of thing. He also spent time studying traditional woodcraft, both in Sierra Leone, as well as I believe he went to school to study in Sweden for a good little while. And so throughout his career, he's interested in the idea, not just of objects, but of the history of how these objects are made and the history of craft, the history of works, workmanship. In this piece here, this is called Bodark Art. And what you're looking at is sort of like one end of it. What he's constructed here is basically a throne and it's basically, it's considered like an elder's throne. So like the elders of a, of a community would have you know, an exalted place to sit. So you as viewer can sit there and view the rest of the piece, which I'll show you here. This is an aerial view of the piece. If you were in that throne, you'd be somewhere seated right about there, very small in comparison to the rest of the landscape. There's a gate down here that actually leads, you know, opens up to a path that leads you to that throne while arcing all the way over here, he's got a wood and stone arcway that goes all the way across the installation and even a little footpath over that pond. So just to give you a little bit of understanding, because I, I used to go see this piece, I used to teach at Governor State. And so I was like, well, what's Bodark? What's all that about? And the term Bodark comes from Bois d'Arc, forgive my French, and so it was a type of wood used by native tribes to create bows. And so it became called like bow wood, trees, trees or bow trees. Um, it got shortened from Bois d'Arc to Bodark by the settlers. And so that reference are to the Osage orange trees, which are all in that grove there and are very native to that region and evidently very strong, very flexible wood. So the shape of the installation is in the shape of what? There's a bow here, again, playing to the trees that are used for making bows and you sit at the head as if you were at the top of the arrow, which could go through the gateway. 
So really very sly play on words, but also showing a deep reverence for the land, for the landscape and for the materials. Really a, a nice place to visit in the summertime. Again, this is the Nathan Manilow Sculpture Park. All righty, let's get a few warnings. Uh, Marvin Gaye certainly warned us about, you know, things to come or things that, you know, we'd have to deal with if we didn't get our environmental act together. And here are a couple of visual artists that are working in that same vein. This is Wangechi Mutu, who comes to us from Nairobi, Kenya. She's now living and working here in the United States. Many of you may be familiar with Wangechi as a collage artist. She does these really incredible collages of women that are like half beast, half machine, half woman, really very powerful work. And her video work, she's coming up with imagery that's certainly as powerful or as grotesque as her still images. But also too, she's working with this idea of the perils of overconsumption. What happens when we just use and use and use and use the environment and consume and consume and don't give anything back? A previous piece she did was called Eat Cake, which had a beautifully clad woman in high heel shoes sitting on the edge of a pond, shoveling cake into her mouth. You know, so for those of you who like chocolate cake, that could be a fun thing. Here in this piece, she's collaborating with a performance artist named Santa Gold. And over the course of the video, it's fairly short and you can catch this online, this Santa Gold figure begins to eat up all the birds and she transmogrifies into this really incredibly grotesque, um, corpulent, nasty looking thing, you know, after she's just eaten up all of the wildlife. I've had some children tell me that it's really kind of a spooky thing to witness. But again, part of her cautionary tales, part of her concern about overconsumption and how we're really pretty much squandering our natural resources. Another artist who's addressing similar issues you guys have probably heard before, I know she's lectured here, this is Candace Hunter. And one of her more prominent bodies of work is a series called Dust in Their Veins. This is only, these are only two images from what's really a very large body of work. And what she's addressing here is the international water crisis and particularly its effect on third world women, which are typically women of color. Um, generally, the bodies are rendered without any heads, without any legs, really kind of stressing or underscoring how helpless these women are to really evolve out of their situation, how they're often kind of stuck. And they're often stuck being the ones having to labor to get the water. I mean, those of us, I'm going to sit here and have a sip of water that I got from my Brita picture that I then got from my faucet. And if you're living somewhere where you don't have that access, imagine you've got to go and get that water. The water you brushed your teeth with today, the water you washed your face with, the water you, you know, clean your clothes, your dishes, your baby, everything. Someone has to go get that water. So there are all these prosaic images. We often see these images of women with water jugs on their heads. They're sort of almost cliche African-American art images but they don't really deal with the reality of having to carry pounds and pounds and pounds of water over miles in a clay jug and the long-term effects on your spine, on your neck. Stop to consider that a cup of water weighs about a pound. So, you know, a gallon of water, eight times 12 is 96, you're looking at about eight, almost nine pounds of water just in a gallon. And then again, you know, you need a lot of water if you have a lot of family. So you can do the math and you get some idea again, what a hardship that can be just to you know, have access to clean water and all the problems that go with that in terms of disease and malnourishment and dehydration and all those sorts of things. So again, really very eloquently and very beautifully encapsulated in this series by Candace Hunter. Another contemporary artist is dealing with issues of shelter and issues of, um, dare we say, access and agency. This is Tonika Johnson, who's trained as a photographer. And one of the many projects that she's getting a lot of attention for right now is something called the Folded Map Project, 
what you what you see here, this is just two vignettes of a larger series. What she's done is she's plotted and checked out addresses on one side of the city and then gone across town to look for that same address on the north side of the city. We Chicagoans know there's a pretty uh, significant divide between the north side and the south side of the city. The north side being more affluent typically, whereas the south side you know, tends to have more economic problems. A lot of the bad news you hear about Chicago is always being focused on the south side. So here in this particular example, she's got 6900 South Ashland to your left, and you can see the blight, the boarded up buildings, the liquor stores, you know, the bus stop with no seat, and compare that to 6925 North Ashland, and you see a different landscape, you know, a landscape that's richer, and there are seats at the bus stop, and just a friendlier environment. So she's not only plotted these pairs of um, houses, but she's also created what are called map twins. She's actually made contact with residents at North Side and their respective South Side address and has created opportunities for those people to dialogue, maybe to visit one another's homes, just to explore and unpack the disparity in terms of economic access, economic resources, just across this one city that we call home. So really very interesting, very um, interesting project in that spirit of um, interactivity. A lot of our you know, younger artists now are exploring projects that get people to dialogue, get people to think. And another such thinker here, uh, let me see, she's recently won, I believe she's just recently won a Three Arts Award. This is Amanda Williams, and Amanda's training is as an architect. So even as an African-American architect, she's very interested in those issues of access to housing or the state of housing stock in communities of color, and really a very, very interesting body of work. This body of work here is probably what she's most known for. This is called Colored Theory, which is a play on color theory. And what she's done here is she's gathered up crews of people to oftentimes under cover of darkness to paint these abandoned houses on the south and west sides of the city. She's done several of them where she's given, usually when you see this X, on a house in Chicago, that's usually a sign that that building is probably you know, slated for demolition. So she's taking these houses and she's painted them, you know, and giving them a fresh coat of paint. One, it brightens them. And two, she's asking a more subtle question about, you know, why is there all this housing stock basically laying fallow when we have people in the city that don't have affordable housing? people that don't have places to live, but yet these houses here are just sitting going, you know, basically going vacant and creating holes in the neighborhoods. And so what she's also done, so not only bringing attention to those housing issues, but really just as a slide play on the color, she's looking at colors that bear resonance in African-American communities that are part of sort of our popular culture, popular history. Um, the blue on the left is the same color as a hair product called Af uh, Ultra Sheen. Um, many Black people wore Ultra Sheen um, hair products when they were younger, and it came in that shade of blue. So many of us connect with that color. The red is from Harold's Fried Chicken, another popular eatery here in Chicago. Again, it's been around since I was a child. So we're familiar with those red and green bags. Other colors she's referenced are like pink as in hair moisturizer, purple as in Crown Royal, the color of the outer bag is usually purple. Um, let's see whether I had pink, we had purple, um, even flaming hot Cheeto orange. Again, something like kind of a popular snack among our kids and stuff made it into her palette. So really a very interesting body of work when taken all together. And she's often exhibited them with different artifacts and interviews with people in those communities where she worked. Next up, we have from good old Peoria, Peoria's native son. This is Preston Jackson. And many of you know Preston, of course, from his work in Peoria, as well as his work as head of the sculpture department at the School of the Art Institute. 
This is a piece that we were fortunate to have here in Chicago for a while, right on our lakefront. This was a sperm whale. And what you can see like in the inset is that the worm, the, I'm sorry, the whale is filled with plastic bottles. And so it's visually arresting. It sort of mirrors the metal looping mm, that you see in the, um, the shell of the piece. But also too, it's underscoring how our aquatic wildlife are being impacted by us casually throwing our water bottles and things into our water supply. Those bottles don't really go away. And even if it's, you know, PETA-5 recyclable, if our fish and stuff start consuming it, it does all kinds of horrific things to their body. So again, trying to imagine a whale trying to, you know, suck in his krill and all that good stuff, instead of sucking in your Dasani bottle, our, our Dasani bottles. All right, next up. I want to talk about a group of artists that are moving beyond just sort of decrying the condition or what the Astrogates would say, making gestures at a problem. These are artists who are very dedicated not only to raising awareness, underscoring a problem, but actually throwing some of their effort into really creating a more positive change. So really with an eye towards social justice. So in this chapter, I'm, I'm calling it, I'm, I'm giving you a little bit of a quote from Audre Lord where she says, the personal is political. Here we have an artist, William Pope L, or just known as Pope L for short, comes to us from Chicago. This is a project that he collaborated with, with a gallery out of Detroit called What Pipeline? And you can check them out on whatpipeline.com to get more information. You guys know about the Flint water crisis and the whole fact that you know people in Flint and the surrounding area have been without clean drinking water now for a number of years. And so what he's done, it's really kind of sly, it's kind of conceptual, kind of cheeky, but very effective. What he did is he actually bottled up that nasty Flint water. So whereas we're used to going to 7-Eleven and getting a cold, frosty bottle of Ice, Mo Ice Mountain, here, you can go and buy a, a cold, frosty bottle of Flint water. What you don't see down here at the bottom is they say it's, what, I think, 20, 16 to 20 fluid ounces, non-holdable. This idea that you can be holding a bottle of water in your hands and not be able to drink it because it's poisonous. So what he did is he actually set up the gallery as a, a store. You could actually go and see the water being bottled up or you could buy bottles. You can get, you know, $20 for a bottle or you can buy it by the case. They had limited edition ones with his name on it. And what he did, I think in four months, he raised $30,000, which he donated back to Flint, to the United Way, to Hydrate Detroit, and all these other um, organizations that were geared towards trying to, you know, stem the tide of this water crisis. So here's someone that's putting his talent and his money where his mouth is, and you still can buy a case of Flint water. So again, at whatpipeline.com, you too can get your Flint water. Another artist that's dealing with issues in Flint, this is Latoya Ruby Frazier. And the piece that you're looking at is from a photographic series she did called Flint is Family. So what she did, uh, uh, LaToya, she went to Flint and she spent about five months there. And what she did is she shadowed a family, a woman named Shekhov and her daughter and her mother, and basically just looked into her life, their lives, I should say, over a course of five months to really get insight into what happens on the personal level. We here in Illinois, we hear about the water crisis and we say, oh, ain't it a shame? but it's different to actually see on a day-to-day -day level just what these people are going through and how they have to dance around this nasty water. Um, it's kind of a personal project for Ms. Frazier. She grew up in Br Braddock, Pennsylvania. And so uh, the water, the aquifers in Braddock were fed by U.S. Steel, a lot of these corporations dumping into the local water supply. 
And so one of her earlier projects deals with that impact on her and her family as they're dealing with cancer, autoimmune disorders and things from all this nastiness put into their water supply. So now she takes that whole idea to Flint and is grappling with the same thing with these families. And so what the scene that you're looking at here is just the whole, the, the struggle just to do something as simple as brushing your teeth. Because again, you can't drink the water, you can't brush your teeth with it. So she, he, she's showing here how Shay, the young lady she's following, has to like pour water into her child's mouth. They have to do this sort of pour out just to do things like brushing their teeth and how everything is reliant on bottled water. Um, meanwhile, companies like Nestle are easily pumping out 400 gallons of water every minute in practically free of charge from Lake Michigan aquifers, you know, which is just crazy where you have people in Michigan who can't get clean water. She takes this a step farther. And so she decides that, you know, she's hearing about all these situations, like, you know, the people who made the decision to send to divert their water from the Flint River, which most Flint, Ri Flint residents know that water is pretty nasty anyway. They're getting water, I think, um, from GM. General Motors is doing their dumping in the Flint River. And someone had the brilliant idea to feed these people from the Flint River. Oh, so with that, there are issues of corporate accountability and social justice that, as far as Latoya Ruby Frazier was concerned, were not happening quickly enough. What she decided to do is she took the proceeds from her exhibition and she invested in an atmospheric water generator. There's a, a gentleman, I think in South America, who had developed a way of pulling clean water out of the air, developing con um, condensation and concentrating it so that the outcome is clean, fresh water. So she invested the money to have this machine brought to Flint and people were trained on how to use it, how to maintain it. And so now this machine, at least during the warmer months of the year, is capable of generating up to 2000 gallons a day of clean water, which was made available to residents free of charge. Get your bucket, get your pail, and just come and get some water. Again, something that we normally take for granted. But here again, an artist who's not content to just say, ooh, this is a problem. Let's go in here, let's roll our sleeves up, and let's find a solution. Another artist that works in that same vein, that idea of really getting into the solutions, is the Astro Gates. Um, some of you know him as a potter, some of you know him as a performer, some of you know him as an artist who works in tar, and he's all of those things. What you're looking at here is a slab of marble that he used as a fundraiser. He got a dilapidated old bank building in Chicago up on Stony Island Avenue, and he bought it from the city for like a dollar. And the thing with you, you know, having those dollar properties is you have to raise the money to renovate them. So it's an old bank, it's huge. And you know, when you first walk in there, the ceilings were caved in, falling apart. So what he did is he pulled these marble tiles from the bathroom of the bank and he had them etched. So what it's a little hard to see, but what you can see here, it says guarantee bond certificate in Art We Trust, Stony Island Investments. And it's signed by Theaster Gates with a little model of the bank over to the right. What he did is he went to Art Basel, a very famous art fair in Miami, I'm oh, sorry, in Switzerland, and um, he sold them. He, sold, he created a limited edition of 100 of them and sold them for $5,000 a piece. What a country. But people were eager to hop on the Astro Gates bandwagon. He's already had a positive track record of renovating properties and turning them into these social centers. So people wanted to be in on this project and he did sell them all. What he did with the money is this. So he turned this old beat up bank building, which was really just falling apart into really a show place. There are areas that you can see on the walls where the paint is still left really rough. But what he's brought in is a reading library. He's, um, he bought out the Johnson Publications collection. So there's that whole Johnson Publishing archive that's housed there. 
He has a vinyl jazz collection from Dr. Wax Records. So you can go and actually listen to jazz on old school vinyl. There are screening rooms. You can see here, there are gallery spaces. So it's become like a type of creative community center. You can still even go on Zoom right now and take a yoga class at the Arts Bank. He's also purchased the gazebo where Tamir Rice was killed and has created a memorial out in the garden of this property. So really showing the power of art and showing the power of a really very persuasive artist who really, again, wanted to put money where his mouth was. So I invite you all to come to Chicago and come see us at the Arts Bay. Another artist that's really doing phenomenal things is Emmanuel Pratt. That's not necessarily him right there, but what you're seeing here is like one portion of what's called the Sweetwater Foundation. Emmanuel has a background in, let's see, what, let's go for architecture and urban design. He worked for Chicago State for a number of years, heading up their uh, aquaponics team. And so what he's created here is really almost like community garden would really just be underselling what he's trying to do. He's certainly interested in creating that community garden because he's certainly interested in concerns about food deserts on the south side of the city, south and west sides, sustainability, of course, and teaching people, you know, where, where does your food come from? And that idea that the, you know, if you don't have a grocery store in your community, where are you getting the fresh food you need to sustain you, to keep you from all these other diseases that you know, affect us disproportionately? And so he's created not only these communi community gardens, but he's also interested in renovating housing in the area. He's basically been buying up properties along here. Um, he's calling it, I, I think, the commons and um, the Prairie Avenue, the Perry Avenue Commons to be exact. And it's a four block stretch of community gardens, renovated housing, multi-purpose buildings that can serve as meeting places, places to hold cooking classes, places to uh, train young people, not only in gardening, gardening, but construction, carpentry skills, ways of reaching out to the un unemployed and underemployed so that they can also apply a trade and make money. So it's more than just a garden, it's really a broader vision of community reinvestment. Um, he, he calls it urban acupuncture, he, where he's just kind of come in, found this one little pressure point that he can stimulate and see if he can actually create value just from that point. So it's really a, amazingly fantastic suite of things that he's got going on here. Um, he's built a greenhouse, there are beehives, um, magic, you know, this amazing barn that he's created, you know, for art galleries and that sort of thing. So really just showing, you know, the power of one man's vision and how it can just really grow and blossom and expand. And oh, incidentally, he won a MacArthur grant in 2019. Very well deserved. All right, on a lighter note, I wanna to talk to you about a few artists who are basically addressing sustainability from the standpoint of let's take things out of the landfill or let's prevent them from getting there in the first place by turning these refuse objects into art. So one man's waste is another man's art. Our first one here um, was basically a Chicago icon for a number of years. This is Mr. Imagination. He was born Greg Womack. And um, he's known here, he's shown here really, I guess, using the medium that he's best known for, which are these bottle caps. If anyone could make anything out of a bottle cap, it would be this guy. And as you see here, he's really laid out from the hat to the jacket, to the tie, to the scepter, to, you know, to the crown. And so he built sculptures out of all kinds of discarded materials. He's really well known for his little paintbrush people that he makes. And if you ever come to the House of Blues here in Chicago, you will see that the bar area and parts of that nightclub were actually emblazoned with his signature bottle cap treatment. 
this is another facade that he did for the House of Blues in Orlando. And what's kind of fun about this particular one, you really kind of see his signature style up front here, but also embedded in the concrete are he's collected these artifacts from the local residents. He's basically asked people to, you know, give me your give me your junk, if you will, you know, the things that you are going to discard but yet may still hold a sense of place or a sense of memory. And so he's embedded all these things into the concrete of the building so that anytime you pass by, you know, you still have these little artifacts that are there to sort of remind you that carry the energy of the people that live there. Next up, we have Garland Martin Taylor. And a lot of his work uh, addresses I, you know, notions of gang violence. It's really kind of an extended protest against that violence. In the course of making those pieces, he does a number of really very interesting things with bullets. So the bullets become part of the art. And so in this one on the left, I think it's called P Flight. He's taken a, um, a bullet casing and actually embedded it with his own hair as well as feathers. So it's kind of an interesting statement. It's like, is the bullet becoming a bird? You know, is it in flight? Um, is it something that might whiz by and catch a piece of my hair or might be something that goes through my head and catch a piece of my hair and my flesh and my bone? So really very interesting things to ponder. On the right, he's repurposed a bubblegum machine and basically filled it with these little feathered bullets. And you can see all the way to the right of the image where these feathered bullets actually sort of hang from the ceiling. Again, underscoring that idea, if you live in certain neighborhoods, you're very likely to you know, have a bullet whizzing by your head at any given time, because even if you're not involved in the violence, if it's going on around you, you still gotta learn how to duck. So really very interesting work and uh, part of uh, complementing a much larger piece he's done, which is actually a huge metal gun made from salvaged metal that, um, it, you know, is emblazoned with the names of children who've been lost to gun violence. So again, really significant addition to his oeuvre, if you will. Um, on a lighter note, we've got Alan Emerson Hicks who really has a very whimsical approach to dealing with the sustainability. He often builds garments, he builds figures, and often sometimes does performance in some of the pieces that he creates. So here, this little lovely fashion statement, just in time for Paris Fashion Week, is called Carnival Maiden. And as you can see, it's made from all those lovely plastic lined bags of chips that we are so quick to discard after we've eaten all the tasty contents. Her crown, if you will, is made from the little rings when you take a top off of say a gallon of water or a gallon of milk. Again, we toss those things, but where do they go? You know, they don't biodegrade, where do they go? So here he's reclaimed some of them for, you know, for our fun and our pleasure. On a broader scale, you know, he not only does like standing human figures, and again, I could do a whole lecture just on his work, but here's a fun one here where he's done the carnival horse. And so a fun challenge would be to sort of see what objects do we recognize here? You know, if you're a beer drinker, there are the caps from your six pack. Um, if you eat fast food, there's that little cone bowl that you use to, um, you know, eat your French fries in or plenty of hangers in there. So really he's someone who has, you know, again, a very serious need to let's pull this plastic and let's keep it out of the landfill. But yet he's, uh, he's doing it in a very whimsical, very lighthearted way. His pieces are always very colorful and often a lot of fun. Next, we have Sydney M. Lewis, who is also working with plastic. Uh, she has a movement that she calls TAGA, which stands for throw away, won't go away. So again, very interested in what happens to these plastics once they leave our hands, because we're so quick to you know, let them go. So what she's given us here is a piece called Underground Bounty. 
And so she's playing with the, the idea that this is made from bounty wrappers, that outside plastic that wraps around your multi-packs of paper towels. So you can see like bits of the bounty logo kind of flowing up in here, but also a really sly play on words that underground bounty in the sense that all those plastic bounty wrappers will end up in a landfill underground somewhere. So it's beautiful, but also designed to make you think. More recently, she's moved into adornment. If you check out her website, she's done a number of dolls, but this is more of her recent things where she's really taken these plastic shopping bags and has turned them into fine jewelry and jewelry that might be actually fairly comfortable. So she's taken them and really beaded them up with wire and really has created some very interesting things. I mean, who's to say that we might not be buying these from Jared one day? Other artists who deal with discards or repurposed materials, this is Willie Cole, and he's given us things that he's made from shoes. He works with a lot of different objects, but he had a period of time where he did a lot of things with pumps. So, of course, on the left, made in the Philippines, a very sly reference to Imelda Marcos, and then a fun piece over on the right called Soul Brother, S-O-L-E Brother. And so I'll leave you to figure out the puns that are inherent in that piece. Another artist that works with discards is Nick Cave. Nick Cave got into this idea of building these kinds of pieces really in the aftermath of the Rodney King incident. Um, he was mulling over the idea that black male lives in particular seem to be disposable, dispensable. And he was idly picking up twigs, again, something that's disposable, dispensable, and came up with the idea of, hmm, what would happen if I were to create a suit out of these discarded pieces of twigs and trees and things? And that was where he developed the very first sound suit. So you see the sound, you know, um, it, it's not just the idea of it making sound, but also that he can perform in them. And he's done a number of public performances. Again, this idea of interactivity and this idea of bringing dance into a public sphere, bringing movement and a certain degree of festivity into the public sphere, just sort of taking art off of its pedestal and bringing it out into the world. So if you look him up, you'll see a number of performances that he does in addition to these really incredibly varied sound suits. This is Shakaya Booker. And so she has taken recycled work to probably the extreme level. Shakaya works with tires. So your steel belted radios, when they go bald and they go flat, they go somewhere. And some of them end up in Shakaya's studio. So I included this piece here to give you a sense of the scale that she works on. We were fortunate in Chicago to have uh, several pieces commissioned. She had maybe two or three pieces in Millennium Park a few years ago. And now she has a new piece that was installed at the 606 Trail. But again, it's really, and if you really think about your tires, it's really hard material to work with. I had the pleasure of meeting her a couple of years ago and she won't tell anybody how she cuts and stitches all those tires. That's like a trade secret, but still really amazing work and really beautiful things when you consider what the source material is. This again, really a play on sustainability. It's so hard to be green. You know, that idea again, like where would these tires have ended up had she not made them into art. And then considering too that for every tire she gets, how many more are thrown away, how many more are tossed. But definitely give this woman a Google, really amazing things that are coming off your tires. I'm gonna round this, our, our odyssey off and I'm gonna talk fairly fast, just talking a little bit about Afro futures and this idea of it's not necessarily directly an environmental issue, but dealing with a broader sense of envisioning a better future. Um, we oftentimes, probably even since slavery, when people were singing about sweet chariot coming for to carry me home, we've had this notion that there's gotta be a better place or a better way to live, or perhaps we can live somewhere free of racism, free of hatred, economic, 
inequality and those sorts of things. So when you hear Afrofuturism in a broader sense, that's some of the thought that's coming behind it. Now, some of it um, is embodied here. Again, this is not an environmental piece, but this is Kerry James Marshall giving us a bit of an Afrofuturistic view. That idea that even though we might be living in a space age, underscoring that need to keep an eye on our culture and keep an eye on how we're trained and what kind of cultural artifacts do we contain yeah, here. So one of a number of Afrofuturistic visions here. Okay, thank you. This is Sun Ra. Sun Ra, um, to say jazz musician is probably a bit of an understatement. This is a man who um, publicly would tell people that he was from Saturn. He is not of this earth and would not answer to anything other than Sun Ra and created a broad um, persona kind of rooted in Egyptian philosophy and other world understanding and cosmology and all those fun things like that to really just create this broader persona, both for himself and for his music. That idea that we don't necessarily have to be confined here, that we can actually exist in a broader space. In fact, um, he has both a song and a film called Space is the Place. So what you see on the right is a movie poster from a film that they actually made of him and you know, with concert footage from his orchestras. A little bit more contemporary, we're looking at, this is George Clinton. Um, you guys might remember, some of you remember Parliament, Funkadelic, the P-Funk, All Stars, Bootsy Collins. And while he may not have necessarily espoused a very strict Afrofuturistic philosophy, he certainly came at it from a very fun place. A lot of the mindset behind his groups were that they were descendants of the mothership, that the mothership came from a planet far away and all these people came off of it to teach us the funk, the P-funk, the pure funk, the uncut funk and so on. So it's very fun, but at the same time, really very futuristic, very sci-fi. And sometimes you could go to a George Clinton concert and actually witness the landing of the mothership in and of, in and of itself very much a colorful character with very engaging, very colorful music and album art and so on. Again, that vision of maybe there's a better place for us. No one embodies that idea better than Octavia Butler. If anyone could certainly be called one of the godmothers of Afrofuturistic thought, certainly she's one of them. Um, ditto with our uh, writers like George Schuyler ahead of her. Um, probably her two of her last three books were incredibly prescient. A lot of her books are you know, science fiction and she's got shapeshifters, mind readers, deep empaths, people who have all kinds of powers, people who have descended from ancient civilizations to be able to inhabit souls at will really amazing characters. And oftentimes African-American women are at the center of her stories, whether they're colonizing Mars or creating a new world order. In two of her last three books, The Parable of the Sower and The Parable of the Talent, they deal with the um, sort of the, tra the travels and travails of a woman named Lauren Olamina, and also from the standpoint of her daughter. And so Lauren, Again, we're dealing with sort of, um, how we say, a dystopian country. Um, at the time that these, you know, the time of the story, which is projected into the future, the country is being run. Now, let's keep in mind here, I'm just going to tell you, these books were written in the mid to late 90s. But back then, she's talking about America being taken over by a Christian fundamentalist, highly conservative authority, whose main goal was to do what? Make America great again. Yes, she talked about that as far back as the 90s. So I'm going to let that hang on the air for a little bit. But anyway, as part of addressing this dystopia that's basically encroaching upon her way of life, the heroine, she goes forth and she's been writing the seeds of a new world order that she's calling Earth Seed, a new philosophy, a new way of being. And she and her cohorts 
they band together to try to find a place where, again, they can live in peace. So they actually create this colony called Acorn. So these two stories are dealing with, these two books are dealing with this one, this woman trying to create a new world order and live in peace among all this crazy political stuff and climate change and corporate greed and all that stuff. Sound familiar? And then also from the standpoint of her daughter who comes across her mother's work later in life and is trying to make peace with the world she lives in and the world her mother was trying to create. An absolutely astounding body of work. If you read nothing else by Octavia Butler, Parable of the Sower and Parable of the Talents will definitely put a chill in your bones, but really amazing work overall. I just, you know, we lost her way too soon before I got to read all, you know, I, I was just hoping there would be more books because I've read them all, but I digress. This is Fo Wilson, Foyalemi Wilson, who lives here in Chicago. And she recently created an installation called Dark Matter. Very interesting. She had a uh, she did a residency at Kohler. Her background is more in design and furniture. She's more of a woodworker. Here she took a divergence and started working in clay for the sake of this installation. So it's this, it was a huge room, and she had a mothership sort of um, structure hanging from the ceiling. And then all these kind of interesting planetary sounds being piped into the room. And she also had pillows. So you, when you entered the room, you could grab a pillow and actually sit in the room and chill. I actually brought a group of my students in and had them go through a guided meditation in that space. And it was really cool because some of my students had never meditated before. And I certainly wasn't trying to like turn them into mystics or cult figures or anything like that. But just the idea of creating a space where you can have a bit of quiet and a little bit of, of peace. And she talks of her celestial objects as being messengers of love. So certainly a very interesting and cool idea. And I, my students really got a kick out of it. And these pictures really, really don't do it full, full justice. So I'm gonna end with another Robert Duncanson piece, kind of coming back to the landscape. And this piece is called Landscape with Rainbow. And so keep in mind, this, this piece was painted in 1859. Slavery had not ended yet. So, and then also too, um, Duncanson lived in Ohio, which was a free state, but right across the river from Kentucky, which was a slave state. So you can imagine how precarious life might have been for people living in that region. So for him to have what Obama used to call the audacity of hope is really kind of an amazing thing. You don't really see a lot of rainbows in landscape painting at this time, okay? And so just to, you know, the end the story and take it full circle, this piece has been gifted as an inaugural gift to the Bidens. And so this piece will hang in the White House as that perennial reminder of having hope, as the, the desire of a man to live free and breathe clean air and enjoy clean water and basically to live in peace. And so with that, I'm going to close out. Remember, uh, again, if you saw a name that turned you on, you know, generate your attention, please give them a Google because for every single person I've mentioned here, there are maybe 10 more that I had to edit out just in the interest of time. So with that, I'm going to thank you and turn it back over to Kristen. Thank you, Arez. Um, if you'd like to turn off your screen. Let's see here in a second. Oh, here we go. All right. Okay. Oh. <laughs> that screen. <laughs> oh, yes. No. Okay, so we'll open it up. I will. I have some questions that we can ask. Okay. Thank you. There we go. Okay. Um, let's see what I probably should have done is keep you keep us together. There we go. Um, thank you so much. I did forget to mention at the beginning that we have the environmental art class from Eureka College joining us today. We're thrilled to have them.
Um, thank you for the journey. Uh, you took us on quite a trip, and I know that we learned a tremendous amount, including how some of the ways in which the making of art has changed and the, and the sort of concept of what makes an artwork. It doesn't have to be on the wall in a gallery. A couple questions uh, to start with. Are Black artists involved in the global impacts of climate change? Sure we are. <laughs> Um, I mean, you know, if you and I and I'm gonna say um, saying black as expanding beyond Africans in America, so to speak, but if you're thinking globally, so whether we're involved, we're certainly impacted by it. You know, issues of climate change are affecting crops in West Africa, which of course is affecting the ability of people to be able to feed themselves. You have corporate problems, say, like a company like um, Nestle, who buys out the water rights to, a to Fiji. You know, people of Fiji now have to pay for their own water, but you can buy a nice, you know, tasty bottle of Fiji water for a song. So are we impacted by it? Certainly. You know, um, the involvement, I think, you know, you're, you're gradually seeing more and more people certainly rolling up their sleeves and paying attention to it. But these things you know, are definitely impacting our communities. How do you think the Black Lives Matter movement is affecting today's art? Well, you're seeing a lot of murals right now and certainly a large amount of protest art. Um, there's been kind of an impetus to beautify communities that have been hit by looting. You certainly see groups like Mural Moves with Dorian Sylvain who've been trying to go out and sort of beautify the streets or boarded up buildings and that sort of thing. But you're certainly seeing a lot of protest work as well. A lot of people are really inflamed about that. Now that may not necessarily be a direct outcropping of the Black Lives Movement organization. Let's just clarify. But this certain, you know, sort of um, rethrust, if you will, of you know black equality black arts movement black power movement that we saw in the 60s that certainly is making a comeback the next question is sort of related um asking if you consider graffiti on buildings a type of art personally i do um it depends on whose work it is and who you're asking you can look at um you know you look at an artist like basquiat he got his start as Samo, as a tagger. Keith Herring, the very same thing. He started out as a subway tagger. And then nowadays you've got Banksy putting things up on walls and people are going so far as to cut away pieces of walls just so they can own a Banksy. Whereas Banksy is really kind of anti-ownership. He's like, put it on the wall, see it, enjoy it. But now people want to own Banksy, so certainly. You know, again, this art teacher considers much of it to be art. Great. We have a lot of people who are, are commenting on, on um, you've shared a lot of hope. This has been inspirational. Thank you for a thought provoking lecture. Um, there is a question whether you would be willing to share your email address. And I don't know if you do that publicly or if you want me to do that privately. Uh, let's see. Um, I don't have an issue with it. Let me see. I'm just, let, let's find one where you can actually get to me. Um, you can do jhawkei20. So that jhawki20 at csu.edu. That's an easy way to reach me. And I just put that in the chat so everybody can find it there. Um, another question. Um, and this is a little... Um, hard to, to figure out how to say it actually. So um, clearly the uh, artists who are working environmentally now are, have a very different kind of artistic practice than say Duncanson did, who was producing easel art that was shown in a gallery and it was meant to be sold. It wasn't and owned by an individual, that sort of thing. So in terms of how they work and how they make a living and, and how they show their work is different. Um, and, it's, and it seems too that there's a more interdisciplinary quality to it. Um, so I wondered if you could talk to any of that a little bit. Certainly. Um, I think it falls into the continuum of contemporary art. If you're looking at contemporary art on a broader scale, 
you're seeing a lot of movement away from those traditional art practices and the traditional white cube model of art making. And you're seeing that across the board. We're seeing a lot more installation. We're seeing a lot more conceptual art. And we're seeing a lot more art that is geared towards interacting and people coming together. Um, I think of one installation that was at MCA where the guy had a couch. And this was during a time where we were going through a lot of strife, you know, there's a lot of conflict with Iran. And so he invited people to come and sit on the couch, kind of like the Red Table Talks now, with an Iranian student. Like you can talk politics with a real Iranian. And so that this wouldn't be an abstract concept. You can see that Iranians are people, everybody's not trying to bomb you, and to promote understanding. Theaster Gates is doing a lot of that sort of thing. So I see it as part of a broader trend of contemporaneity, for lack of a better expression, that artwork is really taking on different forms. But that's only par for the course in art anyway. I mean, we wouldn't be able to call it art if it wasn't continuing to evolve. You certainly see these disruptive movements throughout art history. You know, the Impressionists were disruptors. The Abstract Expressionists were disruptors. So now these contemporary artists are certainly disruptors and certainly throwing their, you know, their hand, their sleeves up and throwing their hands into the world in a very different way. I have one more question I'd like to ask, then we'll open it up for social time. And this is from a candidate for city council actually asking, have you been invited to speak with cities that have areas of blight that need great ideas for new art? No, I have not, but you know, my calendar's open. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank but, um, you. I'll, I'll point out though that Latoya Ruby Frazier has a very dynamic TED talk that outlines her Flint is family project. So maybe one day I could do one too. Sounds good, sounds good. Thank you again. As I expected, you introduced uh, us to many new artists and many new ways of thinking. I think you also reminded us of how we need to be more concerned about the environment and how art can inspire us to do that.